Hello again, and welcome back to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the Restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. More information about the class location and meeting time is available on the class website. Links to this website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And subscribe if you want to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. In this lesson, we're going to review the so-called war chapters of the Book of Mormon, Alma 43 through 63. There are 20 named individuals in the history recorded in these chapters. Rather than review them all here, I'll introduce them as we go. There is an appendix at the end of my notes for this lesson that briefly describes each of them. The events recorded in this lesson include three separate wars punctuated by periods of peace or preparation for war. The longest of the three was the Great Lamanite War, which was fought on two fronts and lasted for seven years. The events in this lesson took place throughout the land of Zarahemla, with much of the action involving a major war between the Nephites and Lamanites that was fought on two fronts, one in the east and the other in the west. This lesson begins the commencement of the 18th year of the reign of the judges, circa 77 BC and concludes at the end of the 39th year of the reign of the judges, circa 56 BC, a span of 22 years. In these slides, I'll abbreviate the chronological term reign of the judges as ROTJ. Recapping from previous lessons, at the end of the 17th year of the reign of the judges, many of the poor Zoramites were converted to Christ through the ministry of Alma and his missionary companions. These converts joined the people of Ammon in the land of Jershon. Unfortunately, their defection resulted in the wealthy and elite Zoramites joining forces with the Lamanites and launching a war against the Nephites. This lesson focuses extensively on war. The scriptures never speak of war in positive terms. For example, they never use words like glory or honor to describe war. According to the revelations given to the prophet Joseph Smith, wicked and unrighteous people engage in war, as does Satan, who makes war with the Lord and his saints. Five times in the Book of Mormon, Mormon called war the work of death. Elder Bruce R. McConkie described war as, quote, probably the most satanic and evil state of affairs that can or does exist on earth. It is organized and systematic murder with rapine or violent seizure of property, robbery, sex immorality, and every other evil as a natural attendant. War is of the devil. It is born of lust. If all men were righteous, there would be no war, and there will be none during the millennium and in the eternal kingdom of God." Unquote. Ancient scriptures and modern prophets and apostles have distinguished, however, between wars of aggression, preemption, or retaliation, and wars born of the necessity of defending one's family, country, and freedom from aggression. We are both justified in and obligated to defend ourselves and our families against violence. The prophet Mormon wrote that the Lord had told the Nephites, quote, Inasmuch as ye are not guilty of the first offense, neither the second, ye shall not suffer yourselves to be slain by the hands of your enemies. And again, the Lord has said, 
ye shall defend your families even unto bloodshed. Unquote. Joseph Smith repeatedly spoke and wrote about the divine obligation of self-defense. For example, he publicly stated in January 1843, quote, while we, the Latter-day Saints, will be the last to oppress, we will be the last to be driven from our post. Peace, be still. Bury the hatchet and the sword. The sound of war is dreadful in my ear. But any man who will not fight for his wife and children is a coward and a bastard." Unquote. Righteous Nephite leaders never rejoiced in war or in taking life. They engaged in war only reluctantly, with extreme sorrow for having to take the lives of their enemies, whom they viewed as their brethren who were unprepared to meet God. Alma chapters 43 and 44 describe the events of the Zoramite War. Following the conversion and migration of many of the poor Zoramites, the remaining elite and wealthy Zoramites agitated for war. Thousands of Lamanites and Amalekites joined their cause and gathered to the land of Antionum, while the Nephite defenders gathered to Jershon. The Zoramites allied themselves with and became Lamanites. The combined Zoramite Lamanite forces were led by a Lamanite named Zarahemna. Mormon contrasted the wicked designs of Zarahemna with the righteous motivations of the Nephites. Alma 43, verses 8 through 12. Quote, For behold, Zarahemnah's designs were to stir up the Lamanites to anger against the Nephites. This he did, that he might usurp great power over them, and also that he might gain power over the Nephites by bringing them into bondage. And now the design of the Nephites was to support their lands and their houses and their wives and their children, that they might preserve them from the hands of their enemies and also that they might preserve their rights and their privileges, yea, and also their liberty, that they might worship God according to their desires. For they knew that if they should fall into the hands of the Lamanites, that whosoever should worship God in spirit and in truth, the true and living God, the Lamanites would destroy. Yea, and they also knew the extreme hatred of the Lamanites towards their brethren, who were of the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi, who were called the people of Ammon, and they would not take up arms. Yea, they had entered into a covenant, and they would not break it. Therefore, if they should fall into the hands of the Lamanites, they would be destroyed, and the Nephites would not suffer that they should be destroyed. Therefore, they gave them lands for their inheritance." Unquote. The people of Ammon gave the Nephites a large portion of their substance to support their armies. They would eventually give them something even more dear and precious. Moroni was the 25-year-old commander of all the Nephite armies. His forces were well-armed, and they wore breastplates and arm shields, yea, and also shields to defend their heads, and also they were dressed with thick clothing. Protective armor was a new technology introduced to the Nephites by Moroni. The Lamanites, although they were well-armed and superior in numbers, wore only loincloths. Upon seeing the Nephites' armor, the Zoramite Lamanite forces changed their plans and headed west through the narrow strip of wilderness that separated Nephite and Lamanite lands. They made for the head of the river Sidon with the intention of going down into the land of Manti and taking possession of it by force. With the help of spies and prophetic guidance from Alma, Moroni learned of the Lamanites' plans he left part of his army in the land of Jershon to defend it from a surprise attack and took the remainder with him to defend Manti. Moroni marshaled the people in Manti to defend their lands and their country, their rights and their liberties. Moroni's Nephite army lay in wait for the Lamanites in a valley to the west of the river Sidon. Moroni's spies informed him of the course of the Lamanite armies. He divided his army and concealed half of them south of the hill Ripla, east of the river Sidon. This second division was under the command of Lehi. The Lamanite army, on its way to take the land of Manti, passed on the north side of the hill Ripla and began to cross the river Sidon. Lehi's army swept out from the south side of the hill and attacked the Lamanites on their rear. 
the Lamanites turned to engage them, and the work of death commenced on both sides. The Lamanites took heavy casualties because of their lack of protective armor. The Lamanites retreated west across the Sidon. Lehi's forces pursued them, but they stopped when they came to the river. Moroni's forces in the valley to the west of the river met the Lamanites in combat. The Lamanites fought with exceedingly great strength and courage. They did fight like dragons and did smite in their fierce anger and managed to overcome the Nephite armor and kill many Nephites. Once again, Mormon commented on the moral superiority of the Nephites cause. Alma 43 verses 45 to 47, quote, Nevertheless, the Nephites were inspired by a better cause, for they were not fighting for monarchy nor power, but they were fighting for their homes and their liberties, their wives and their children, and their all, yea, for their rights of worship and their church. And they were doing that which they felt was the duty which they owed to their God. For the Lord has said unto them, and also unto their fathers, that inasmuch as ye are not guilty of the first offense, neither the second, ye shall not suffer yourselves to be slain by the hands of your enemies. And again, the Lord has said that ye shall defend your families even unto bloodshed. Therefore, for this cause were the Nephites contending with the Lamanites to defend themselves and their families and their lands, their country and their rights and their religion." Unquote. Moroni inspired his disheartened forces with those words, and the Nephites cried with one voice unto the Lord their God for their liberty and their freedom from bondage. The Nephites were renewed in strength, and the Lamanites were forced to flee. The Lamanites fell back to the river Sidon, where, to their horror, they found themselves surrounded. Moroni's armies blocked them on the west, and Lehi's army blocked them on the east. Moroni commanded the Nephites to halt their attack, and he and Zarahemna met to discuss ending the conflict. Moroni affirmed the Nephites' righteous motives and intentions, and commanded Zarahemna, in the name of God, their faith, and all that was most dear unto them, to surrender their arms and swear never to attack the Nephites again. If they did so, Moroni promised that the Nephites would spare their lives, otherwise the Nephites would be forced to destroy them. Zarahemna gave his own weapons to Moroni and asked to depart, but he refused to swear an oath his people could not keep, preferring to perish or conquer. Moroni returned Zarahemna's weapons and again insisted that the Lamanites swear an oath of peace. Zarahemna attacked Moroni, but one of Moroni's soldiers broke Zarahemna's sword and cut off his scalp. The Nephite soldier placed Zarahemna's scalp on his own sword and raised it as a symbol of what would happen to the Lamanites if they didn't accept Moroni's terms. Many Lamanites threw down their weapons and took the oath. Zarahemna was outraged and commanded the remainder of his army to fight. The Nephites engaged them again in battle and the Lamanites began to go down to defeat. Zarahemna begged for mercy and promised to take the oath of peace. The Nephites disarmed the Lamanites. The Lamanites took the oath and departed into the wilderness back to their own territory. The number of dead on both sides was too great to count. The bodies of the dead were cast into the river Sidon and the Nephite soldiers returned to their homes. The Nephites gave thanks to God, fasted, prayed, and worshiped with immense joy because of their deliverance from the Lamanites. This ends Mormon's abridgment of the record kept by Alma. Chapters 45 to 62 contain Mormon's abridgment of the record of Helaman, who succeeded his father Alma as record keeper of the Nephite people. At the commencement of the 19th year of the reign of the judges, Alma gave his final counsel to Helaman. He questioned his son concerning his faith. After Helaman responded affirmatively to all of his father's questions, Alma blessed him and promised that the Lord would prosper him in the land. Alma shared a prophecy with Helaman and commanded his son to write it down, but not to make it known to the people. 400 years after Christ would come among the Nephites, the people would dwindle in unbelief, fall into the works of darkness and lasciviousness and all manner of iniquities, and be destroyed by wars and pestilences. 
only the Lamanites and those who allied with them would remain, and they would kill the few remaining disciples of the Lord. Alma then gave a final blessing upon the land for the righteous sake, and a cursing upon the land to those which do wickedly. This is the cursing and the blessing of God upon the land, he said, for the Lord cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Alma departed out of the land of Zarahemla and headed for the land of Melech, but he was never seen again. The Nephites speculated that he was taken up by the Spirit or buried by the hand of the Lord, even as Moses. Helaman and the other sons of Alma went forth to declare the word and establish the church, but the Nephites' wealth and pride led to contention and disagreements, and the people refused to listen to their words. Chapters 46 to 49 describe the Amalekiahite War. A Nephite named Amalekiah wanted to be king over the Nephites. He and his many followers, including lower judges and dissenters from the Church of God, revolted against Helaman, the high priest. They sought to destroy the Church of God and to destroy the foundation of liberty which God had granted unto them. Mormon remarked with sadness on this turn of events. Alma 46, verses 8 and 9, quote, Thus we see how quick the children of men do forget the Lord their God, yea, how quick to do iniquity, and to be led away by the evil one. Yea, and we also see the great wickedness one very wicked man can cause to take place among the children of men." Unquote. When Chief Captain Moroni learned of Amalekiah's movement, he ripped his coat and wrote upon it, in memory of our God, our religion and freedom and our peace, our wives and our children. He called this the title of liberty. He fastened it to a pole, put on his armor, prayed mightily to God for liberty, and rallied the Nephites to his cause. Many people joined him, putting on their own armor and rending their clothing in token or as a covenant that they would not forsake the Lord their God, or in other words, if they should transgress the commandments of God or fall into transgression and be ashamed to take upon them the name of Christ, the Lord should rend them even as they had rent their garments. Moroni told his followers that they were descendants of Joseph, whose coat was torn into pieces when his brothers sold him into Egypt. He cited a prophecy of their ancestor Jacob, grandson of Abraham, that they were a remnant of his seed, ripped away from the house of Israel, and they should therefore preserve their liberty and not allow the rebellious Nephites to cast them into prison or be sold into slavery or be slain as Joseph had been sold and cast into prison. Moroni led his followers into battle against the Amalekiahites. Amalekiah, seeing his forces were outnumbered, fled with his followers south toward the Lamanite territory in the land of Nephi. Fearing that Amalekiah would stir the Lamanites to war again, Moroni marched with his army into the wilderness, where he captured most of Amalekiah's followers and brought them back to Zarahemla. Amalekiah and a small number of his men eluded capture, however, and escaped to the land of Nephi. Moroni gave the captured Amalekiahites an ultimatum, covenant to support the cause of freedom or be put to death. There were but few who denied the covenant of freedom. The title of liberty was raised in every Nephite city, and it became their standard, or flag, ensign. There was peace in the land and order in the church. Many died of old age and disease, but firm in the faith of Christ. Having escaped Moroni's forces, Amalickiah went among the Lamanites and stirred them up to go to war against the Nephites. The king of the Lamanites sent out a proclamation ordering all his people to go to battle with the Nephites. Most Lamanites feared for their lives and refused to obey the king's command. So the king made Amalickiah commander of his army. This is what Amalickiah had plotted to happen. Amalickiah led the king's army to confront the Lamanite resistors. Amalickiah pretended to surrender to Lehonti, their leader, if Lehonti would make him his second in command. Lehonti accepted Amalickiah's terms but Amalekai secretly poisoned him, 
upon which the Lamanite resistors fell under Amalekiah's command. Amalekiah and his forces marched to the city of Nephi and, through subterfuge, murdered the king of the Lamanites and chased off the king's servants. Amalekiah and his forces took possession of the city of Nephi. They deceived the queen into thinking that it was the king's servants who had murdered him. Amalekiah married the Lamanite queen and became king over all the Lamanites. Determined to overpower the Nephites and bring them into bondage, Amalekiah incited the Lamanites to war. He set up Zoramites as chief captains over the Lamanite armies and moved his forces into the wilderness in preparation to strike the land of Zarahemla. While Amalekiah was consolidating his power in the south, Moroni was strengthening the Nephite armies, throwing up banks of earth round about to enclose his armies, and also building walls of stone around their cities and lands. He also placed the bulk of his forces in the most vulnerable parts of the land of Zarahemla. Mormon, who was himself a military leader, described and praised Moroni. Alma 48, verses 11 through 13, and verse 17, quote, Moroni was a strong and a mighty man. He was a man of perfect understanding, yea, a man that did not delight in bloodshed, a man whose soul did joy in the liberty and the freedom of his country, and his brethren from bondage and slavery, yea, a man whose heart did swell with thanksgiving to his God for the many privileges and blessings which he bestowed upon his people, a man who did labor exceedingly for the welfare and safety of his people, yea, and he was a man who was firm in the faith of Christ, and he had sworn with an oath to defend his people, his rights, and his country, and his religion, even to the loss of his blood. Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, if all men had been, and were, and ever would be, like unto Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever, and the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men." Unquote. Considering the great esteem Mormon had for Moroni, it's no wonder that he chose to name his own son after the legendary chief captain of the Nephite people. Captain Moroni taught the Nephites to fight only in self-defense and that they would prosper and be protected if they kept God's commandments. Moroni's faith was not in the shedding of blood, but in doing good in preserving his people, yea, in keeping the commandments of God, yea, and resisting iniquity. During this same time, Helaman and his brothers preached and baptized. The Nephites humbled themselves and were mostly free from internal wars and contentions for four years, but not from external ones. The Nephites were soon compelled reluctantly, with great sorrow, to take up arms to defend their own lives and the lives of their families. The Amalekiahite War began at the end of the 19th year of the Judges, with the Lamanite armies marching on the Nephite city of Ammonihah in the west. The Nephites had rebuilt the city and fortified it against attack. The Lamanites had a numerical advantage, and this time they wore armor, undoubtedly copying the Nephites, but they were astonished at the Nephites' defensive preparations. Amalekiah did not personally lead the Lamanite armies, and his chief captains were hesitant to go up against such a well-defended city, so they retreated into the wilderness. The Lamanite army instead moved against the land of Noah. They were determined to not retreat this time, but they discovered that Noah had also been fortified with high earthen walls, and that Lehi was leading the Nephite armies in that city. The Nephite defenders beat the Lamanite attackers back repeatedly, the Lamanites tried to dig through the walls, but they were defeated in that attempt as well. More than 1,000 Lamanites were killed, with no Nephite deaths, and only 50 wounded. The Lamanite chief captains had all been killed in the battle at Noah, so the Lamanite army fled in the wilderness back to the land of Nephi. King Amalekiah was furious at this defeat, and he swore an oath to drink Moroni's blood. The Nephites again thanked God and dwelt in peace among themselves. For the next three years, the Nephites continued to fortify their cities with towers and defensive walls of earth and wood. Up to this time, Lamanites possessed the wilderness west of Zarahemla by the seashore 
and on the east by the seashore, and thus the Nephites were nearly surrounded by the Lamanites. As part of the Nephites' defensive preparations, Chief Captain Moroni commanded his army to go into the east wilderness and drive out all the Lamanites that were in it. He repopulated the eastern coastal area with Nephites. He also placed armies in the south at their border with the Lamanites and had them erect defensive fortifications. Once they had secured the eastern coast, the Nephites did the same thing on the west, forcing the Lamanites south into the land of Nephi, fortifying the line between the Nephites and the Lamanites, between the land of Zarahemla and the land of Nephi, from the West Sea running by the head of the river Sidon, the Nephites possessing all the land northward. With the northern lowlands secured, the Nephites built many new cities, including several that were along the eastern shore that they named Moroni, Aaron, Nephiha, and Lehi. The Nephites prospered and lived the covenant God made with their ancestor Lehi. There never was a happier time among the people of Nephi since the days of Nephi than in the days of Moroni. Three years passed away in peace. Those three years of peace came to an end due to an internal conflict. The Nephites who lived in the land of Morianton claimed part of the Nephite land of Lehi. The people of Lehi appealed to Chief Captain Moroni to resolve the problem. Morianton, the leader of the city that bore his name, feared that the Nephite armies would be marshaled against him, so he made plans to flee north through the narrow neck to the land of desolation. One of Morianton's female servants, whom he had badly abused, escaped and informed Moroni of Morianton's plans. Moroni, fearing that the people of Bountiful would join Morianton's group, sent an army led by Teancum to intercept Morianton. Teancum met them at the narrow pass, killed Morianton and some of his followers, and took the remainder as prisoners. The survivors of Morianton's group returned to their land and made peace with the people of Lehi. That same year, Nephiha, the chief judge of the Nephites, died. His son, Pahoran, became the new chief judge and governor over the Nephites. The Great Lamanite War is described in Alma chapters 51 to 62. It was preceded by the rise of the king men. The year after Morianton's revolt, some of the upper class elite Nephites in Zarahemla demanded that Chief Judge Pahoran amend the law to make it easier to overthrow the free government and to establish a king over the land. When Pahoran refused, these people, who were called king men, revolted against him and tried to replace him with a king. Those who supported Pahoran called themselves free men. This matter of their contention was settled by the voice of the people, and the free men prevailed. The king men were silenced for a time. This was the worst possible moment for the king men to make their move. Amalickiah was arming and massing his Lamanite forces for a second invasion, and this time he attended to lead them himself. When the king men learned of the advancing Lamanite armies, they decided to sit this one out, just to spite their opponents, who had supported liberty. Moroni was exceedingly wroth, and he asked Pahoran for emergency authority to compel the king men to fight. Moroni and his forces took up arms against the king men. They killed 4,000 of them and threw their leaders into prison. The remainder of the king men yielded to the standard of liberty and were compelled to hoist the title of liberty upon their towers and in their cities and take up arms in defense of their country. Amalekai and his forces attacked in the east and in a lightning offensive took possession of the land of Moroni and the cities of Lehi, Morianton, Omner, Gid, and Mulek, all of which were along the seashore. The Lamanites then marched on the city of Bountiful, a strategic location that was the last line of defense, preventing the Lamanites from getting through the narrow neck and into the land north and completely surrounding the Nephites. Amalekai's forces were met at Bountiful by Teancum's army, who outmatched the Lamanite army in their strength and in their skill of war. After nightfall on the eve of the new year, Teancum and his servant snuck into the Lamanite camp 
Antiankum put a spear through Amalekiah's heart while he was sleeping. Mormon divided his narrative of the Great Lamanite War into the events on the Eastern Front, described in Alma chapters 51 to 55 and 59 to 62, and events on the Western Front, as recounted in an epistle Helaman sent to Moroni, found in Alma chapters 56 to 58. The conflicts in these two areas took place simultaneously, so these two sections overlap each other chronologically. We'll review them in the order they're described in the Book of Alma, starting with the Eastern Front. With King Amalekiah dead and Teancum's army ready to give battle again, the Lamanite forces retreated to the city of Mulek. Amalekiah's brother, Amaron, became king of the Lamanites and commander of their armies, and he continued to prosecute the war his brother had started. He ordered the Lamanite armies to continue to hold all Nephite territories that they had taken. Teancum chose not to try to retake the captured lands, but rather to wait for reinforcements from Moroni. Moroni sent him a large number of men, along with orders that all prisoners of war should be retained in hopes of a prisoner exchange, that the land of Bountiful and the narrow pass leading to the land northward were to be fortified against Lamanite encroachment, and that Teancum should use every opportunity to regain the cities captured by the Lamanites. Amaron himself returned to the land of Nephi and assembled an army that would march into the western part of Nephite lands in an attempt to draw some of the Nephite forces there and relieve the pressure on Lamanite armies in the east. Moroni was unable to come to Teancum's aid as he was leading the Nephite forces against the Lamanites in the south by the West Sea. Mormon called these developments dangerous circumstances for the Nephites. Moroni made preparations to leave adequate Nephite forces at the south and west borders and come to Teancum's aid. In the meantime, he sent orders to Teancum to make an attack upon the city of Mulek and retake it if it were possible. Teancum prepared for the attack, but he determined that it was impossible to win such a battle against a fortified city, so he continued to wait for Moroni. After nearly a full year, with both sides locked in a stalemate, Moroni arrived at Bountiful with more reinforcements. Moroni and Teancum conferred with their chief captains about the best way to break through and retake Mulek. First, they tried inviting Jacob, the Zoramite leader of the Lamanite force occupying Mulek, to meet them in battle in the plains between Bountiful and Mulek. Jacob refused, so Moroni and Teancum came up with a new plan. Teancum took his army and marched toward the seashore as a decoy, while Moroni and his army marched into the wilderness west of Mulek. Jacob's spies spotted Teancum's army, and the Lamanite garrison left Mulek to pursue Teancum, who retreated north to the seashore. With only a few Lamanite guards left to defend the city, Moroni's forces swept in from the wilderness and quickly retook Mulek. Pursued by the Lamanites, Teancum turned back toward Bountiful, where he and his forces met up with Lehi's small army that had been left to defend the city. Faced with a now superior force, the Lamanites quickly retreated back toward Mulek, only to discover that Moroni had already retaken the city and had come with part of his army to engage them. With the Lamanite army surrounded, Moroni commanded the combined Nephite armies to attack the Lamanites until they surrendered. Jacob was killed in the battle, and Moroni was wounded, but the chief captains of the Lamanite army eventually surrendered and threw down their weapons. Moroni took the Lamanites who would not surrender as prisoners to Bountiful, where they were forced to bury the dead of both sides and to build defensive fortifications. Lamanite King Amaron wrote to Moroni about a possible prisoner exchange. Moroni was pleased to receive this news since he was anxious to stop using his provisions to sustain his Lamanite prisoners. The Lamanites had captured many women and children while the Nephites had only captured combatants. So Moroni also saw this as an opportunity to liberate as many Nephite civilians as possible. Moroni wrote back to Amaron. He affirmed the Nephites commitment to their righteous cause and he warned Amaron 
of that awful hell which awaits to receive such murderers as thou and thy brother have been, except ye repent and withdraw your murderous purposes and return with your enemies to your own lands. He offered a three for one exchange. For each Nephite man, woman, and child the Lamanites released, Moroni would release one Lamanite soldier. If Ammon refused, Moroni warned that he would come against you with my armies. Yea, even I will arm my women and my children, and I will come against you, and I will follow you even into your own land. Yea, and it shall be blood for blood, yea, life for life, and I will give you battle even until you are destroyed from off the face of the earth. Amaron responded angrily, accusing Moroni of murdering Amalickiah and promising to avenge his brother's blood. He asserted the Lamanites' right to rule, based on their belief that Nephi had stolen that right from his brother Laman. He agreed to Moroni's terms of exchange and closed his letter by telling Moroni, If it so be that there is a devil and a hell, behold, will he not send you there to dwell with my brother whom ye have murdered? Angered by Amaron's response, Moroni refused to proceed with the exchange, and instead devised a plan to free the Nephite prisoners at Gid. He searched among his men for a Lamanite, and found Laman, a former guard of the Lamanite king who had been killed by Amalickiah. Laman had switched allegiances and now fought on the side of the Nephites. Moroni sent Laman to the city of Gid with a small group of Nephite soldiers. Laman told the Lamanite soldiers at Gid that he was a Lamanite prisoner who had escaped from the Nephites and that he had brought some Nephite wine. The Lamanite guards eagerly drank a lot of the wine and passed out from intoxication. Laman and his men returned to Moroni and reported what had happened. Moroni and his men went to Gid with a large supply of weapons, which they threw into the city for the Nephite prisoners to use. In the morning, the guards awoke to find that Moroni's army had surrounded the city and that their Nephite prisoners inside the city were armed. Moroni could have killed them all in their intoxicated state, but he did not delight in murder or bloodshed, but he delighted in the saving of his people from destruction. And for this cause, he might not bring upon him injustice. He would not fall upon the Lamanites and destroy them in their drunkenness. The Lamanites surrendered Gid without a fight and the Nephite prisoners were freed. The captive Lamanites were forced to fortify the city of Gid, after which Moroni had them taken as prisoners to Bountiful. The Lamanite armies tried to use the Nephites' own tactics upon them, including surrounding the city at night and trying to give wine to the Nephites, some of it poisoned. The Nephites were wise to the Lamanites' plans, however, and did not drink any wine given to them without having the Lamanite prisoners test it first. Moroni began making plans to free the fortified city of Morianton from Lamanite occupation. Chapters 56 to 58 contain an account of the Western Campaign. These chapters are an extended quotation from an epistle written by Helaman to Moroni, received at the commencement of the 30th year of the Reign of the Judges. In the West, the war was going badly. The Lamanites had captured the Nephite city of Manti and its surrounding lands, as well as the cities of Zeezrom, Cumeni, and Antipara. They had also killed many Nephites and possibly deported captured Nephite chief captains to the land of Nephi. The Nephites in this part of the land were falling into iniquity. The situation was so dire that the people of Ammon, the former anti-Nephi Lehi's who lived in the land of Melech, were ready to break their oath of nonviolence and take up arms. Helaman and his brothers feared for their souls and persuaded them to not break their oath. Instead, the sons of the people of Ammon, who had not taken the oath, being too young to do so at the time, entered into a covenant to fight for the liberty of the Nephites, yea, to protect the land unto the laying down of their lives. Helaman described these young men in his epistle to Moroni. Alma 53, verses 20 to 21, quote, And they were all young men, and they were exceedingly valiant for courage, and also for strength and activity. But behold, this was not all. They were men who were true at all times in whatsoever thing they were entrusted. Yea, they were men of truth and soberness, 
for they had been taught to keep the commandments of God and to walk uprightly before him. Helaman marched his army of stripling warriors to the city of Judea, where he met and joined forces with Captain Antipas. Antipas and his army had fought valiantly and suffered greatly at Judea, and the arrival of Helaman's forces gave them great hopes and much joy. Seeing that Antipas's force had been strengthened by Helaman's 2,000 young men, the Lamanite king Amaron canceled his planned assault on Judea and instead fortified the positions he had already taken. Helaman expected the Lamanites to try to bypass Judea and advance northward towards Zarahemla. He sent out spies, hoping to detect this move so his army could attack the Lamanites from the rear. The Lamanites, however, knew they didn't have the strength to attempt such a bold campaign, so they chose to maintain their current positions rather than risk confronting the Nephite forces near Judea or in the east at the Sea of Nephiha. Helaman and Antipas received provisions from the people of Ammon, along with 2,000 more soldiers from Zarahemla. This caused the Lamanites to increase their raids to stop the Nephites at Judea from being strengthened. Antipas decided to try to lure the Lamanites into a trap. He ordered Helaman and his 2,000 stripling warriors to march past Antipara as if they were carrying provisions to the Nephite city by the sea west. As Helaman's army passed Antipara, Antipas also marched from Judea, leaving behind a few men to guard the city. A strong Lamanite force from Antipara spotted Helaman's army and pursued them northward through the wilderness near the sea west. When they realized they themselves were being pursued by Antipas, they hastened their advance, hoping to destroy Helaman's army before Antipas could overtake them. Then the Nephite army suddenly stopped. Helaman asked his young soldiers what they thought they should do. Helaman reported movingly to Moroni in Alma 56, verses 45 to 48, quote, And now I say unto you, my beloved brother Moroni, that never had I seen so great courage, nay, not amongst all the Nephites. For as I had ever called them my sons, for they were all of them very young, even so they said unto me, Father, behold, our God is with us and he will not suffer that we should fall. Then let us go forth. We should not slay our brethren if they would let us alone. Therefore, let us go, lest they should overpower the army of Antipas. Now they never had fought, yet they did not fear death, and they did think more upon the liberty of their fathers than they did upon their lives. Yea, they had been taught by their mothers that if they did not doubt, God would deliver them. And they rehearsed unto me the words of their mothers, saying, We do not doubt. Our mothers knew it. Unquote. Helaman and his sons doubled back and came upon the Lamanite army and Antipas's army, locked in battle. Antipas had been killed, and his exhausted soldiers were about to go down to defeat. Helaman's army engaged the Lamanites, giving Antipas's force opportunity to regroup and attack from the rear. The surrounded Lamanites surrendered. When Helaman counted his young soldiers, he was overjoyed to discover that, by a great miracle, not one of them had been killed. Some of Antipas's army took the Lamanite prisoners to Zarahemla. The rest joined Helaman's army and returned with them to Judea. Amoran sent an epistle to Helaman, offering to surrender the city of Antipara in exchange for the Lamanite prisoners who had been taken in the battle. Helaman responded that his army was strong enough to take Antipara by force, and that he would only exchange Lamanite prisoners for Nephite prisoners. Amoran refused his offer. Helaman prepared to invade Antipara. The Lamanites occupying the city abandoned it, however, and escaped to the other occupied cities. Antipara was once again in Nephite hands. With the aid of fresh supplies and 6,000 reinforcements from Zarahemla, plus 60 additional young men from the people of Ammon, Helaman's army surrounded the city of Cumenai and ambushed some neat Lamanites who were attempting to resupply their garrison there. Cut off from their supply chain, 
the besieged Lamanites surrendered Kimenai and possibly Zeezrom as well. This presented Helaman with the problem of dealing with an excessive number of Lamanite prisoners of war, many of whom were taking every opportunity to rebel against their Nephite captors. After having been forced to kill 2,000 Lamanite prisoners, Helaman assigned Gid, one of his captains, to escort the remaining captives from Kumenai to Zarahemla. The next day, more Lamanites arrived and attacked Kumenai, and Helaman's army engaged them. Gid and his army unexpectedly returned and they were able to assist the Nephites. Helaman described the performance of his Ammonite stripling warriors. Alma 57, verses 20 and 21, quote, And as the remainder of our army were about to give way before the Lamanites, behold, those 2,060 were firm and undaunted. Yea, and they did obey and observe to perform every word of command with exactness. Yea, and even according to their faith it was done unto them. And I did remember the words which they said unto me, that their mothers had taught them. Helaman's faithful sons drove the Lamanites back to Manti, and the Nephites retained Kimenai. Again, to Helaman's astonishment and extraordinary joy, all of his 2,060 sons were still alive, though all of them had been wounded and 200 had fainted from severe blood loss. Helaman ascribed this to the miraculous power of God because of their exceeding faith in that which they had been taught to believe, that there was a just God, and whosoever did not doubt that they should be preserved by his marvelous power. After caring for the wounded and the dead, Helaman inquired of Gid what had happened to the Lamanite prisoners he had been tasked to escort to Zarahemla. Gid informed him that the prisoners had revolted along the way, and he and his men had been forced to kill many of them and chase after others who fled. Gid had abandoned the pursuit to return and aid Helaman. Helaman and Gid both ascribed this turn of events to God's power of deliverance. Helaman's next objective was to retake the strategically important city of Manti, but he didn't have the numbers to assault the city directly because his men were needed to hold the lands they had already retaken. The Lamanites were also wary that he might try a ruse as he had done before. Helaman was forced to wait for reinforcements from Zarahemla before he could begin his attack. He sent a solemn message to the chief governor in Zarahemla, informing him of the situation and his desperate needs. While he waited anxiously for a reply, the Lamanites and Manti were receiving supplies continuously and engaging in regular skirmishes to wear down Helaman's forces. After many months and nearing the brink of starvation, Helaman received some food and only 2,000 reinforcements. He couldn't understand why so few men had come to his aid, and he feared that the Nephites might lose the war. Helaman's army prayed for deliverance, and the Lord did speak peace to our souls, and did grant unto us great faith, and did cause us that we should hope for our deliverance in him. Helaman went forth with his small force, and camped by the wilderness south of the city of Manti. Lamanite spies learned that Helaman's army was few in number, so the Lamanite army prepared to attack the weaker Nephite force. Helaman sent Gid and Teomner, each with a small group of men, to hide in the wilderness on the left and the right of Helaman's position. The Lamanite army came out of the city of Manti and charged toward Helaman's army, while Helaman feigned a retreat into the wilderness. The Lamanites pursued Helaman, and Gid and Teomner's forces rushed in and retook Manti, defeating the handful of Lamanite soldiers who had stayed behind to guard it. Helaman led his army as if they were heading for the land of Zarahemla. Fearing a Nephite ambush, the Lamanites reversed course and returned to Manti, unaware that the city had been taken. Helaman's army also doubled back, but they took a different route and, foregoing sleep, arrived at the city before the Lamanites did. When the Lamanites came to Manti, they were astonished to find it occupied by the Nephite armies. And thus it came to pass, Helaman reported to Moroni, that by this stratagem, 
we did take possession of the city of Manti without the shedding of blood. The Lamanites completely abandoned the Western Front, taking with them Nephite women and children as prisoners. Helaman concluded his letter to Moroni by describing the strategic challenges the Nephites faced. First, he didn't have enough men to hold all the cities they had retaken in the West. Second, he didn't know why the government in Zarahemla had been unresponsive to their requests for supplies and reinforcements, and he feared that a faction in the government was withholding aid from them on purpose. Third, he didn't know if the Lamanites had regrouped their forces in the East and overcome Moroni's army there. Regardless of these challenges, Helaman trusted that God would deliver them out of the hands of their enemies, and he praised his sons for their total obedience and faithfulness, and he declared that they had been preserved by the hand of the Lord. The narrative now returns to the Eastern Front. Moroni was overjoyed to read Helaman's epistle, and he shared the good news of Helaman's successes with everyone in the region of Bountiful. He immediately wrote an epistle to Pahoran, the chief judge in Zarahemla, asking Pahoran to send more men to reinforce the southern and western borders so Helaman's armies could retain the lands they'd retaken. Moroni then began formulating a plan to achieve victory in the eastern campaign. Meanwhile, the Lamanites who had been defeated by Helaman at Manti made their way to the east coast, where they attacked and occupied the city of Nephiha. Moroni had miscalculated how easy it would be for the Lamanites to take that city, and he and his captains began to doubt if the war was winnable due to the wickedness of the Nephites. Moroni grew increasingly angry at the lack of a response from the chief judge, Pahoran, and he fired off another letter to him, accusing him of being apathetic in defending liberty and of transgressing the laws of God. He asked Pahoran incredulously, can you think to sit upon your thrones in a state of thoughtless stupor while your enemies are spreading the work of death around you? He warned him, except ye do administer unto our relief, behold, I come unto you and smite you with the sword. He called Pahoran to repentance and implored him to be actively engaged in the cause of freedom. He closed by declaring, I seek not for power, but to pull it down. I seek not for the honor of the world, but for the glory of my God and the freedom and welfare of my country. This time Moroni received a reply from Pahoran. Moroni had been mistaken about the cause of Pahoran's inaction, for there had been a coup in Zarahemla. Rebels led by a man named Pacchus had overthrown the government, established a king, and formed an alliance with the Lamanites. Pahoran had been forced to flee Zarahemla to the city of Gideon, and he was trying to rally the Nephites in the area to come to his aid. He sent what few provisions he could spare, and he begged Moroni to come with some of his men to Gideon, join with him, and take back the Nephite government. Grant Hardy has noted that Pahoran's reply is a model for de-escalating interpersonal conflict. Pahoran had every right to be offended at Moroni's mistaken accusations. Instead, he expressed his grief at the circumstances in which he found himself and pledged his support for Moroni and his cause. Moroni rejoiced to know that Pahoran was still faithful to the cause of liberty, while he mourned for the iniquity of those who had rebelled against the chief judge. He left Lehi and Teancum in charge of the Eastern Front and took a portion of his army to Gideon, raising the title of liberty along the way and calling for volunteers to join him. Thousands flocked to his cause. He joined up with Pahoran and his supporters at Gideon, and together they retook Zarahemla, defeated the rebels, and killed Pacchus. Pahoran was restored to the judgment seat. Pacchus's kingmen supporters were tried according to the law and executed. After restoring the rightful government in Zarahemla, Moroni sent 6,000 men to assist Helaman in the west, and another 6,000 to join Lehi and Teancum's forces in the east. He and Pahoran led another large army east, defeating a Lamanite force along the way and requiring the captured prisoners to covenant that they would never again take up arms against the Nephites. Moroni and Pahoran then marched on the occupied city of Nephiha. The Lamanites, facing a superior force, 
remained within the city and refused to engage the Nephites. Moroni himself climbed the city wall at night and determined that the Lamanite army was gathered within the city by the east gate. He and his men used ropes and ladders to scale the western walls of the city, and when the Lamanites awoke, they discovered that Moroni's army was inside the city. The Lamanites abandoned Nephiha and fled to the sea east, but the Nephites overtook them and killed many of them. Not a single Nephite had been killed retaking Nephiha, and many Lamanites who had been captured desired to join with the people of Ammon. Moroni and his army then marched on the city of Lehi. The Lamanites who occupied it abandoned the city and fled. Moroni's force chased them to the land of Moroni on the coast. The Lamanite king Amaron and his remaining forces gathered there to make their last stand. The Nephites surrounded the city and both armies rested for the night. Teancum, who was exceedingly angry with Amaron and his brother Amalickiah for instigating this long war, slipped into the Lamanite encampment and impaled Amaron with a spear, just as he had previously done to Amaron's brother. This time, however, Amaron's servants were able to kill Teancum before he could escape the Lamanite camp. Lehi and Moroni greatly mourned Teancum's death. The next day, Moroni and his forces went up against the city, killed many of the Lamanites there, and drove the rest out of the land eastward. The Nephites had at last cleared the entire land of Zarahemla of the Lamanite armies and gained victory after seven years of brutal warfare. With the war finally ended, many of the Nephites and Lamanites were humbled because of their afflictions, while many others were hardened against God. After fortifying the Nephite lands against further Lamanite attack, Moroni and Helaman both returned to Zarahemla. Moroni retired and turned over command of the Nephite armies to his son, Moronihah. Pahoran returned to his role as chief judge. The church and government were put in order again. The Nephites prospered again and humbled themselves before God. Alma chapter 63 is a coda that describes some of the post-war events. Helaman died four years after the war's conclusion. Helaman's younger brother, Shiblon, took possession of the sacred records and walked uprightly before God. Moroni died soon after. Six years after the end of the Great War, 4,500 Nephites migrated north into the land of desolation. A man named Hagoth and his followers built ships near the narrow neck of land and launched into the sea west, heading north. They were never heard from again. Eight years after the war, Shiblam died. Before his death, he conferred the records on Helaman's son, Helaman III. Some Nephite dissenters stirred up the Lamanites to attack the Nephites again, but Moronihah and his army defeated them. That concludes our lesson and our study of the Book of Alma. In the next lesson, we'll begin our study of the Book of Helaman by reading about Helaman III's administration as chief judge and the ministries of the brothers Nephi II and Lehi IV. The reading for next week is Helaman chapters 1 through 12. See you then.